Good evening, everybody. I would like to call the uh, May 22nd Economic Development Committee. Uh, first up tonight is Cornell Cooperative. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I, I do think the new television is quite phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> TV slash um, computer. Okay. So, and I like the screen because I can I hear it. So I just wanted to give you guys a little update. We've had all, all the clinics for the fair have met at least one time. Um, and they're, everybody's meeting regularly. It's, it's been exciting because as of last year, they had, we're doing it all virtually. So we're trying to really get people this week. I'm going to the livestock committee in person, um, just to try to get us, you know, all organized and on the same page for what's coming up. Um, I wanted to give you just a little update. Some of the things in our milk bar are going to need a replacement. I just wanted you to know that ahead of time. Yes, the range is a thousand to 15,000 because it depends on if it's compressors or full replacement last year. Tara um, was wonderful from the health department. She let us go through, but there's some things I'm concerned about keeping temperature the entire time, which when you're dealing with dairy, you won't do. So we'll have a full evaluation, but I just wanted to give you guys a bit of heads up on that. Um, so our ag educator, uh, Athena, who was here first, she started the first day of the fair, probably not the best time to start. She has given her resignation and today was her last day. So we are hiring for this position again, and just in full transparency, in 10 years, eight times. And so we know what some of the challenges are. We've shifted some, and I'll talk a little bit about how um, Rachel was with me's role will help this. And so we also added a new 4-H um, environment um, coordinator. So they're gonna be, we're adding another position that half your time is 4-H to help that position. That position gets really, they're 35 hour a week, you know, they're getting paid, you know, $23 an hour is the maximum we're able to with our budget to do. And they come with a bachelor's and a couple of years of experience. And it's been very hard to retain people. But with the change of the ag educator position, Rachel, seven hours a week works on this. And also having this combo position where we can leverage other funding. So they'll have a new person. We have four applicants right now. We just posted it last week. So if you know anyone coming on from Colgo School or wherever, and they've worked in education, they did 4-H, those were our people. I think part of the challenge for the person that we just had who was wonderful is she had not done any 4-H. And I think that it really has to be a part of it for that position because it is, it, it, if you haven't lived it, it's very hard and it, it stretches you in ways that are, are different. And so um, that's something that we, we're really looking at. Um, Positive. We've done a lot of collaborations with 4-H and Master Gardener planting days. Um, we're adding an ADA garden bed for folks who have uh, different abilities. We did wild plant foraging last um, Thursday in Hudson. We had a sold out crew come and chase all the different wonderful things. We make a salad and we eat it at the end. Um, we are doing environmental um, awareness days at Taconic Hills. We're doing ag days at Ichabod Crate in Taconic Hills. We're doing a lot of mindfulness 4-H on weekends. Also, some new things are anger management for adults and for teens. So this is all part of the 4-H curriculum. So if you guys have some teens with some rage, bring them our way. And it's mm -hmm. a great program that's led by our social worker, um, Megan Gardner. The HAY program is a new program that we uh, created with the Youth Bureau. HAY stands for um, hiking, archery, and yoga. So it's alternative sports that are related with 4-H, but they can get sort of involved with 4-H in a community level. So those are some of the kind of ways that we've done things a little bit different. Um, we are at, you know, Hudson, Hudson after school program, as well as Greater Promise Neighborhood. We are also at um, Martin Van Buren and Taconic Hills, Ichabod Crane, and it's supposed to be whichever school district serves Kinderhook, and we were arguing about it completely because it's split. Where else, where does Kinderhook go? All those take a lot of All those take a lot of green. Okay, we had a... Well, the other one. side is uh, Maple Hill. Okay. Chittons. Oh, that's Stuyvesant. Yeah, Stuyvesant. yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a couple. couple. All right, thank you. Because there only got very few. There though. was a kerfuffle about that. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there's a kerfuffle. Like, I don't know. Um, so sorry. Um, and the Manfred Gardeners uh, mm -hmm. have been at a lot of the farmers markets and are in the libraries. Uh, we are replacing the septic at the Esme building, which is the one we had wanted to rent to the preschool, but we couldn't. Um, they've now bought another building. But we're going to um, we're going to I think we're going with JNR. We've got four quotes, and that's to replace. It's basically just a tank. Luckily, it wasn't an old VW because that happens sometimes. You just open it up and it's something that you can't think. So we're 
going to replace that in that building and have 15 people in it for like a meeting like this would be a great for that big room. Um, and then the meeting hall um, will be used for the other purposes. Uh, June 6th, we have our first volunteer day on site with Regeneron. They are going to pull in bases and plant natives in a section where we're then going to use as a demonstration model for what you do with, because a lot of folks have land here that was once productive ag land that went back to kind of a woodland and in it. There's so many invasive species that we're going to teach them as we pull what we do. And now we'll be a demonstration site and how to protect it using different uh, techniques with our master gardeners. Um, and we're also going to have an on-site archery range if you guys want to have your meeting there with us to bring the archery back, which um, is very exciting. Yes. So that's kind of this. If any questions on, on a little overview so far? Um, the two positions are, are they 35 hour positions or? Yes. They both are. They're both five days a week, 35 hours after five years. I'm going to the sales pitch to you. After five years, you're vested in New York State retirement systems, benefits, 14 paid holidays, 12 vacations. <laughs> you know, okay. but, and there is opportunity for professional uh, development. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Have you reached out to Chatham about that case? Or um, I, do you know if we've done any at Chatham? Chatham running 11 and 2. Um, I don't think so, not yet. I'm not sure, and that's usually based on where. So for Chatham and um, let me find out about that for Chatham and New Lebanon. And they and the EAD days serve a lot of other schools will come with their classroom that's predominantly like a fourth and a fifth grade. Um, New Lebanon. I'll Do we need out. to introduce yeah. you to the new Lebanon school superintendent? Do you have connections there? I don't. I would love to. Love okay. To, I would love to meet. Them. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Um, My last question you, is, you get too does much. Regeneron want to come to Chatham and pull crab apple out of our I So you want to hear something super cool about them? Yes. So this is so cool. So I'm at the Net in the Hanukkah, up to here and waiters, showing people how to do it, because I've been doing it for a long time. And um, they have all this group come and they volunteer. So Regeneron, every month, goes out and they will do these are three things they do. They pull invasives, they plant natives, and they do conservation work. So if you can show how it will impact, they look for these days. So I've, I'm sorry, I stole them for three days. I have them coming in June to Hudson, July to April, and then in October, they have, a, in October, they have a giant day where they bring 50 volunteers and we're using them to plant um, ginseng crops in our, in our agroforestry. They're phenomenal and they're all scientists. Are they doing it this at, at your campus right around 66? Yeah, on June so time's up? That's going to be from 9 to 12, and that's our invasive whole day. In the, and this is look at the regener funny, regener regeneration on ag land, all of these different problems from these really, really, you know, aggressive invasives. And like, how do you deal with them? And what do you infill with? So you are welcome to them. But in the, in the, I think put you in contact with the, the person that we met with. I literally met him in the, in the creek, and it was like, so, so how did you get all these people here? And it's part of their employee retention is that they do the service programs, and we are in their catchment area. So they have to do one a month. Yeah. And in October, they have five days. I only stole one, but there's an application that you do, and it's, it's amazing. It builds such capacity and great camaraderie for staff and stuff. And they're very interested in agriculture. So it's really cool. Um, the most exciting part of the evening is this is Rachel Sylvester, who's our new ag educator. And I'm going to let her talk a little bit about herself and what she has been doing since she started a month ago. <laughs> a lot. Okay. So, first, I'll kind of introduce myself and my background. So, I grew up in Western New York, so uh, about an hour and a half. Um, my family had a 200 head cook dairy. We also had a cow dairy at one point, but doing both at the same time is a little hard. <laughs> um, so I participated in 4-H and FFA all throughout school, heavily involved in 4-H. I showed almost every animal that you could show at the fair, except horses, alpacas, and rabbits. So it was a lot of fun, did that all. Um, FFA, I did tons of contests from leadership, development, speaking contests to livestock judging at nationals. Um, and I loved all of that and knew I wanted to do stuff with agriculture in the future. So I went to Global Skill and I wanted to diversify kind of my knowledge. Since I had that livestock animal background, I got a science degree. So I learned so many cool things with that. And then I found myself in the care area after I met my now fiance and I worked at a couple of farms there. And then I'm working on my master's and working at CCE. I really like it. Um, what I've been doing for the past month that I've been here 
is I've had a bunch of farmers or new common farmers reach out to me with questions that they have and I've been documenting that. If you look at that, if you haven't, and go out on a couple of farm visits, get to know some farmers as well. I have some farms set up to do tours of the Ohms and Dutch Hollow in June. Um, I also have gone to Bolts County's Farm Bureau and going to meet with the president of the Columbia County's Farm Bureau and talk about some things that kind of can help the community. I'm also, like uh, Lisa said, helping out with the 4 H and doing like an environmental awareness day. So, we're being some station, I think that day. So, I hopefully get to bring my sheep to so talk nice. about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have a baby that can drink off the bottle if we want to. <laughs> I've also participated in some farmland trust committees, or not committees, meetings. And that's about that. Do you guys have any questions for me? Any so questions? A, so she had to get, here's how we got her. She had to meet someone in college who lived locally in order to get her to move here from that far. And that's it. So we we're crafty her. that way around here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the is a and when we were on the edge, I thought she said her fiance was a ferret, and I'm still cool with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but her fiance is a ferrier over in. Do we advertise at Cobble's? We do, but it's very like, hard to get, to get a lot of people end up going back to their, back right. to their, their family farms or like, right. you know, because that's you send your kid there often because you're, that's what your expectation is for, you know, carrying it forward. Yeah. How many farriers on this side of the river either? I'm yeah, sure a, lot a, a lot more than A lot more than you think. Really? Oh, yeah? yeah. Um, so I know quite a few farriers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's a couple. So don't know the number exactly. Quite a bit. Enough to keep your fiance sharp. Large yes. animal vets were yes. getting running low on, but farriers, there's yeah. plenty of. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And the good thing, maybe not the good thing, a lot of them are getting older. So the younger guys are going to get a lot more horses, yes. which yeah. could be a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> and then last week, I think it was Thursday before she came in, she texted me and she said, Is it okay if I'm a little bit late? And I was like, yes, I didn't see the rest of it. She's delivering a, delivering a cat. I'm like, yeah, that's a little late. It's wonderful to have Rachel, and I know that if you guys have any questions and if you want her to come out to visit either of you guys agricultural property, I think it would be great for her to come and see, you know, different um, agricultural uh, community that's or part of the supervisors. I think that would be super nice. If you know folks that want to. many farms. I know you mentioned Dutch Hollow, but um, yeah. if you need any connection with any of those folks, let me know. I'm just waiting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying to get out there and everybody. And I'm assuming maybe I shouldn't assume, but since you came from Cobble Skill, uh, you must know Phil Trowbridge already. Um, I know him, but I don't know him. Okay. So that's that's the person on Thursday yeah. at the livestock committee. Yeah. He, he hauls a lot of kids back. Yeah. Usually yeah. around fall. He better not try to steal her from us, that's why I. I'm going to have to work at time. Yeah, he, he'll, he'll, he'll meet her with the livestock committee on Thursday in person. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome aboard. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Any more questions for Lisa or Cornell? All right. <laughs> Mike, uh, the CDEC. Thank you. Good afternoon. Jessica is with me today. Uh, we uh, concluded, uh, for those of you who weren't able to get to our uh, annual meeting at the Coastals, uh, where we had about 120 people. Very good crowd. According to Helen's count. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what the bill represented. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a good crowd. And uh, so the speaker did a great job. And uh, the, who, Dr. Garvey Urchel, the president of the hospital. And, uh, you know, I think the Regional Economic Development Council uh, is about to come out with uh, a study on healthcare uh, in the region and uh, primarily focused on the work, workforce aspects of it. So it dovetails very well into, uh, into her remarks. And uh, we, um, so I thought we would uh, give you that. Um, in terms of programming, 
uh, on broadband, I, I have a call on Friday uh, with New York State broadband office. Um, I emailed them and indicated that we were down to somewhere between five and six hundred uh, because uh, Ankrum and um, I'm sorry, Austerlitz and uh, Ghent are pretty much done. I think Mid Hudson has some poles that they haven't been able to get the licenses released for, just slowing them down a little bit. But they're you know they're committed to the addresses that need to be served. Um, and we're working uh, with uh, Canaan and New Lebanon, along with uh, Dave Berman, in connection with uh, getting pricing from Consolidated uh, for those two towns. So the Consolidated is the only provider. And uh, so we can get pricing. And I think there are a handful of addresses that uh, were missed in a previous. Uh, Austerlitz, I think. And, and Austerlitz yeah. that will be added uh, into that package. So when that happens, you know, we are at 500. Uh, you know, our concern is uh, how do we put ourselves in line with state money? And, and um, so I wrote them and said that, you know, the providers had suggested, which two of them had, that we do a RFP. Uh, a, to identify real time pricing uh, for those addresses that each of them were interested in doing we would un identify the overlap as part of that process where consolidated and spectrum might both want an address, but more importantly, you will identify the 150 to 200 that no one wants. And um, so I, and, and then I said to them, if we're able to do this, this could be a pilot program for you to determine how you're going to, uh, on a, a smaller test case, uh, distribute the funds once you receive them from, from the feds. Uh, they emailed me back the next day to set up a meeting, and uh, but their schedule was such that it was 10 days out. So I think, um, you know, there's difficulty in asking for a price when you don't have money for the expense because uh, you don't know what contingencies uh, the provider is going to build into that process. Is there a way to get the providers to generate a list of the Private roads and, and long private drives that would be the other the other part of what we're missing still. We yeah. did on all of the addresses, the twelve hundred addresses that we had identified uh, a year ago. Uh, we did pay to have him uh, using uh, GP you know, using mapping uh, to identify the distance from the road to the principal structure on the property. So we have that data. Because yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that those people, I understand that it's there problem that they chose to build their house off along private drive or on private road but the other reality is they didn't realize that fiber would be a utility or broadband would be a utility someday and they didn't uh, plan for it and they now they can't afford the ten or twelve or twenty thousand dollars to get line put in. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a if we're looking to we can speak with a for hundred percent coverage to me that's a, a way of showing the state we can yeah. speak really good. my understanding was that in Kent and Austral uh they brought they didn't abide by the 300 foot rule uh, in terms of they brought it right to the house. So, but I think to, to your point, there, at least in Canaan, there are private roads that people didn't realize when they purchased their homes were private. They look like town roads. You know, yeah, a lot of people don't understand yeah. what a private road is when they're right. buying. Right. We did have a woman we spoke to, uh, trying to remember who asked me to call her. Uh, and uh, it was $10,000. Project Galveston. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. She calls me every week or two. Yeah. <laughs> so I will keep that in the forefront of this conversation and report uh, back to you independently because our next meeting obviously is uh, you know, two months from now. Or, or have the providers build it into their budgets. Right. Well, the grant money, exactly. Right. right. Okay. You want to be able to tune in on the 25th of the USDA's update? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know about that? Yeah, it's a webinar. Yeah. I can get you the, the link. But, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit of, more than a little bit of push on the time that it's any consolidated to get back to us. Is is the sale the fact that they're for sale delaying conversation, or do you think it's just work? No, I think it's work. I mean, they're so far down the food chain here that uh, the people who are buying it don't know that there's an office in the whole <laughs> My view, some of these other obligations are getting wrapped up. Are you going to have a revised list of the homes? Yeah. That are okay. Yeah, I didn't want to spend any more money going out and doing more inventory. I wanted to go to the providers and say, uh, 
you know, here's 500 addresses, and they'll come back and say, well, made it, wait a minute, you missed three here, and uh, these are already served. The holiday came to us saying their engineers messed up, yeah. and they're going to hit these other roads all for the same cost. So and, basic, nice. the same. Yeah. and basically, our understanding, yeah. our understanding from Consolidated and uh, Mid-Hudson was uh, that they basically uh, agreed to pay 60% of the cost of the uh, work. And the case of, again, and Austerlitz, the town paid 40%. And in Green County, where they took $2 million of ARPA money and had the rest of the addresses done, it was basically the same split on an average. It might be you know, a little bit different on any particular job. They're explaining to me when I met with uh, Mid Hudson recently that uh, they showed me a road. I don't remember which one, but you know, if you, they could come over the hill this far, but for them to go further, you know, consolidate or spectrum should come over in the other direction because the distance between the last house and the next house was twice as the distance as it was from spectrum as connection in each direction. So, so they called spectrum, who called right back and said you'd be over there. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we did agree. We did have um, an indication from several supervisors that uh, Archtop, after the county uh, notified them through us that uh, we weren't uh, in favor of going forward with an agreement that would uh, tie the county up as their sole provider or sole partner in broadband, uh, that they have sent individual emails to certain towns. Uh, I did speak to a couple of the supervisors that where that happened. Uh, my understanding was that uh, the closing, uh, Archtop's closing on GTEL was supposed to have happened uh, two weeks ago. I, I haven't had time to confirm whether that actually closed uh, with uh, with Bruce. I thought I would see him at an event uh, last week, and I didn't. But you know, it's. Uh, I did share that letter with our town attorney, who kind of chuckled at it and said, "Yeah, you don't want to do this." Well, the key to that the letter <laughs> is, uh, and what it was is, they wanted to be uh, work with the county to identify broadband grants, and to the extent the county qualified for broadband funding through that grant, Archtop would do the application and all the work, but the county agreed to then give all of the proceeds of the grant uh, exclusively to Archtop. Right? Aren't they late to the party? Yeah. Well, yes, yes, but well, we've been to the party. Yeah, yeah. GTEL's been to the party since round one. Well, but see, now that they own GTEL, it's a different story, right? Okay. Because I have to now treat them as one of the four county providers, and this was before they bought GTEL. Okay. So, well, still, if you have other providers in your town that are already providing a service, I don't want to lock them out either. That's yeah, fine. well, I think that what I said to them was, look, you know, the governor is pushing that there be more than one provider in each town, but let's get the holes filled. And then if there's an opportunity to overbuild for the purpose of competition in a particular uh, concentration of population, you know, go for it. Uh, but I said, what if uh, you had just closed on GTEL and you called me up and I welcomed you to the county and said, uh, by the way, uh, next week, uh, the county is going to pass a resolution to enter into an agreement uh, with Consolidated to be their exclusive you go crazy and he said yeah I would. <laughs> but i think in, in one respect uh going to a town would have been the smarter uh process in the beginning because that's what they did with saugerties they did the village and the town of saugerties they did try the town of catskill and they got kind of sent away i know they went out to hillsdale there wasn't much uh feeling that they would ever get to hillsdale because they've always explained to us and i think to the county as well you know, they're setting up in Kingston at the old IBM facility. And they're going to come up 9W, Saugerties to Catskill, come across the river to Hudson, to Stock, Stockport, to Stuyvesant, to Troy, and then, you know, branch out from there. But even if they were the county's exclusive, uh, if they signed that agreement, everywhere where there was an obligation, there was a comma and it said to the extent allowed by law comma and you know if the county got that money in certain circumstances they would have to do a, a, a public bid uh I mean, there are all kinds of things that would have precluded any of that uh those things in that agreement to be executed, executed. yeah so 
So you know, I'm, I'm optimistic, but we don't want to lose sight of uh, the last, you know, success isn't measured by 80 people who don't get it. And the other thing we're looking at, uh, and we're talking with uh, Warren Hart in Green County and, and Sean Groton is cell tower service. Uh, you know, the governor did do a cell, cell tower report uh, in the last administration that just kind of got shelved. And uh, so, so we're going. We've had folks come out and ask to poke around again. Yeah. I've gotten two letters. Yeah, so we have sites and people, but they don't seem to be willing to pay. Is it right? right. property owners that had sites, but then they didn't offer them any money. So, yeah. you know. So, uh, and then on, on affordable housing, uh, you know, Chris Brown uh, was not able to join us tonight, but, uh, you know, he's been having meetings. Uh, I know Brenda and Ron both are both on co-chairs of, of the committee. You know, I think what we're, what Chris and I have been talking about is we need to, when ideas come up, we need to research them. We need to identify the pros and cons, but it's not the role of CDC in this process. Uh, just because we're looking into something uh, to have someone say that we're recommending it. And I think that's really going to be up to the task force. Uh, and we are meeting with uh, the town of Ankrum's uh, Dan Hall and Bonnie. Uh, oh, she's on the town board. She's on the town board. Art probably knows. Yeah. Art, and we, Art knows. Hunt. Hunt. Uh, uh -huh. we're, we're meeting because um yeah with with bonnie hunt and dave hall they want to talk to us uh about setting up um a housing trust but you know there's several those words mean a lot of different things to a lot of people uh and so uh i had asked chris i don't know if he had been in contact with you about this but we're going to listen to them and then report back to you okay sounds good so um I don't know that we want 18 housing housing trusts uh, because uh, A, you'll be competing for the same grant funding and B, you'll have du duplicative uh, administrative overhead. Uh, the other thing we have talked about is we met with uh, Chris Watts uh, in the county attorney's office to better understand the foreclosure process in the county. And clearly the county you know, does uh, historically make money on, on these in excess of what uh, may be owed for back taxes and interest and service charges. Uh, you know, some of these land trusts, housing trusts, land banks, uh, the model is where whoever's doing the foreclosure on, on, on the back tax projects, they, they often donate for free uh, those pieces of property for affordable housing. But, you know, we don't think that really works here because two things happen. And I think the supervisors, you've seen this when perhaps you did hold back a parcel that was up for tax sale and use it for a cell tower or an expansion of a, a waste uh, station. The two neighbors who wanted to buy it to make sure the waste station didn't get any closer to their house, uh, they wanted to split it. Uh, say that you know that was unfair because they would have bid for it the county would have gotten money so what we spoke about this morning uh, at the CEDC loan fund and we did find two examples of where this has occurred before where if there was a not-for-profit we would be willing to loan 50 up to 50 percent of the assessed value of the property up to a uh, up to fifty thousand dollars for that not for profit for that to that not for profit to be able to go to the auction and bid. And then if the not for profit was able to get that uh property uh at the cost and we're assuming at that point they're getting it below the market value because uh if they were the successful bidder, um, you know, that would enable them to uh hopefully find a developer that all in the cost would be less than if it was uh, being done at market. Uh there are two places uh, where we found that they're they're doing this. Obviously, um, what we would do it, it would be it's similar to what HDC or what we CEDC did for HDC it would be a two-year interest-only loan, and at the end of the two years, if they hadn't uh, brought it to a housing development uh, project, 
they'd either have to pay us for it or we would uh, force them to sell it. And this works with single family homes? Well, it'd be for a vacant lot. It'd be for a, yeah, a, a, a trailer, you know, a trail. There's a, Art has a project of parcel in Ankrum uh, where I think it's about $160,000 uh, value, but it's like $25,000 in back taxes. I'm like, what if we, you know, and I'm just talking here, but I've been involved in these foreclosures for years and there's always an issue with directed sales. I'll tell you that, yeah. you know, yeah, we, but, you know, I could consider the concept of, you know, if there was a 501c habitat or somebody that wanted to be involved in these to share a list with somebody when we have a foreclosure list and say, is there a property that you'd like to make a directed sale offer to yeah. and maybe work that through, right. you know, um, for just purpose, sense, yeah. and that may be where you're coming in to help fund it too. I don't and know. someone told me that uh, the state is going to is in the process of enacting legislation that yeah. that if uh, you do sell it for more than what the tax and the servicing and interest yeah. might be, that has to go back to the. I agree that. You know, it's it's it. Yeah. So that's that might be challenge in court. I believe yeah. at the moment in time, but that could really change the whole. Yeah, landscape. I could make this a the landscape. Yeah. Right. But we wanted, and we we've talked to Habitat about this, and what Troy Welby told me was, when they buy property, which it's not donated to them, uh, yeah. and that's and, and, and that's Habitat in general, <laughs> they never use uh, endowment to buy that property. They always get along. You mean how Troy is with CLC? I mean Troy. Okay. Troy, yeah. I didn't mean Habitat. You but mean CLC. CLC. Yeah. They would never use their endowment to buy a piece of property that they're going to use for development. They uh, they would use, they would get a loan. Right? Or a fundraiser. Yeah, with mm -hmm. a fundraiser. And you know, we could play that role. So the thought was if someone was out there and wanted to do it, rather than have them pressure the county into saying, well, we're not in a position to, to give you a person look at it or have it for free, that there's a vehicle for them to be able to uh, make a decision to bid on it themselves. Wouldn't there be any conditions on what the um, and not for profit sold it to the developer? Yeah, I think that's the goes back to your point where yeah. it's that's the only time that you get to tell them how long it has to be affordable, uh, what you know, what what, uh, what 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 the conditions would be. And I think some many so cases who's enforcing that or who's regulating that that would be your well I think at that point I think money or, well we would put it in the loan documents yeah and then it, then uh the not you're not talking about a deed restriction well I think the the not for profit if they're uh habitat did deed, deed restrictions habitat could yes but, but uh, yeah no we wouldn't yeah we're never going to touch it depends the on who the developer is though if the developer is yeah. not for profit they can right. put a deed restriction right. Because we're never going to own the property, right? We're going to loan people. We don't own the property. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 who's, so who's the nonprofit? Well, you know, if a, a town or the county uh, wanted to set up a housing trust, they're not for profit corporation. Uh, similar, and we've worked very closely with Michelle Turlow to understand what she's doing in the city. Uh, in fact, there was a planning grant to uh, for that she was looking to apply for. And at the 24th hour, not the 11th hour, mm -hmm. she, she realized that only a not-for-profit could apply. And her the city housing trust is not organized under that section of the law. So we worked with her and we became the applicant, but we did call the state and told them that, look, you know, they want to form the not-for-profit housing trust and they haven't done it and we're going to be the stand-in for them and the state said fine so uh but i was thinking more of uh i know sh she has been talking with the land conservancy for almost a year about uh playing playing a role here and in other areas of uh, the state and the country the land conservancy does uh, get involved in more than just scenic vistas and open fields they do get involved in this type of because work. they do this monitoring already on all of their yeah. easements so it would be right. easy for them to monitor the housing uh, you know i don't want to be in a situation of seeing the article that i read in the adirondack explorer that said affordable housing colon mission impossible uh, but it is a, a very difficult issue when 
you're looking at the lack of uh, infrastructure, you're looking at uh, the cost of building, you're looking at, uh, you know, we're still in the $400,000. We can't lower the price of concrete to buy loads. So yeah, maybe in sale price right. or labor. Right? Right. And so- um, We could relax regulations. Well, and I talked to someone recently, I said there's no development project, single family home or, or mega project that you're not going to have people opposed to in some form or another. But we'd have to find basically a clean site or clean vacant site that would attract a, a multi-family developer to do two units, four units, whatever for think there. And then they'd have, they'd have to go figure out with the Department of Health how to do septic, septic and yeah. well, I mean, again, we're back to the Department of Health. And, right. And trying to do multi-family small rural units, which is very not up there. Well, I don't think yeah. anybody really wants to take this on because the amount of work that's involved, but really we need to look at a septic, smaller septic systems. There should be a provision for shared septic systems. So mm -hmm. they put it announced to. Yeah. And you know, Adam uh bought uh, Bosch from Patterns before he went to Patterns, he worked for the New York City Water Supply as a in a public relations yeah. role. But he told me that they partnered with uh, one of the Castile Mountain not for profits to do uh, promote and help do the design for shared sewers, uh, septic sewers. There's, there's green shared septic, there's above ground mm -hmm. shared septic. We're just there we go. Natural some to manage in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Without having that element to it for shared water and shared septic, you're never going to attract somebody to do two units or four yeah. units or three units. We're yeah. running out of Volkswagens. We are, <laughs> and I'm also concerned that you know I don't have definitive news, but uh, there's some several of the people that have been looking at multi-family projects, in the six, one or more of the six communities that have water and sewer, uh, are telling us uh, it's going to be on hold for a while because of uh, economic, yeah, issues. economic issues. That's why it's a good time to do smaller units. Find and Habitat out. said they're working on like a three house per five acre model this mm -hmm. year in Septic. Uh, uh, Chris was actually Chris at their groundbreaking yeah. and yeah. did a marvelous job representing you guys at the film on groundbreaking for Habitat. But well, thank you. I think, think that, they're looking at that here or in their general scheme of things. I think it's a general model they'd like to present because I, in the town of Chatham, I have acreage that the town owns that you know yeah. is, is idle. So, and I'd so like we, to see something over that. And, so. and Suzette had given me, which I passed on to Chris, obviously. Uh, she gave it to me a couple of years, a year or so ago, uh, a list of all town and county owned property. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the issue is. The capacity of any of these groups, whether it be Habitat or the Land Conservancy or, or uh, even groups like Hudson uh, River Housing, Housing or Rubco, is you know, how many can they build at a time? And you know, two, four, six, eight, ten isn't going to cut it. If we went back to the governor's very aggressive uh, plan, what I can't remember exactly, but I think in, in Chatham it was going to be. 32 units in three years had to be built. And, you know, that's only one town. And, and I think that, I, uh, you know, so I, I do think that we continue to have to put the focus on, but the goal here, you know, as we, uh, you know, we good news is we're only six months into it. Uh, and uh, I think we've done, uh, Chris has done a really good Chris job good in the first six months. And I think we just have to be able to uh, find a, cookie cutter template that allows people to get started. It would be good if Chris could follow up with the, the Habitat multi-unit yeah. sewer system to the DOH to see if somebody there can. Those are single, I think. They're they're in individual ownership, so they're a single. There's a separate sewer system for each. We did have an initial conversation. I, was, I thought Scott, Scott McInnes was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Al's number two there. Yeah. He had mentioned that maybe it's shared, but. But we're looking at, we did talk to, I uh, had an initial conversation with Jamie Malcolm from DEC, who is one of the people that uh, is very different. I mean, he uh, very strict on the, on the regulatory uh, forefront. But I do think we need to talk to the county uh, health department and, and, and DEC and, and get a model. And, yeah, we were looking at a project that, uh, you know, if you were to go put 10 or 12 homes in, in a community that had water, either you know, well water or municipal water, 
Uh, I have reached out to a couple of engineering firms to see, you know, what would it take for them to do a presentation for us on small package systems as a uh, marketing tool to get uh, work to build a few. When I talked to HRC a couple of months ago, is it HRC? I never get the acronyms right, whatever. They, the distinction is rentals versus owned. If they're in single ownership, you can have a shared system, mm -hmm. but if they're, so rentals. rentals would qualify for, but single family yeah. ownership does not qualify. Yeah. So it depends on what habitat's building, whether mm -hmm. they're building rentals or owned. So ownership. rentals is qualifying for nothing. Yeah, that's, that's at least what the state told me. <laughs> So to me, the, the, the only model that currently works here is Habitat because of their basically free labor or volunteer labor, subsidized labor and subsidized material costs. I don't know the issue else. is they're building three houses a year, so that doesn't, I mean, it's yeah. it's good as far as it gets, but that's basically that's what it is. That's our total budget for Columbia County. Yeah. So the other thing is, I just saw Dee Dee last week at the, one of the diner stops, and she assures me that the housing compact is already uh, back alive and well. And I said to her that aside from removing their ma mandate, which I thought she was going to have to do in order to sell it, that they needed to remove the per town requirement and consider regional uh, regional targets because that is how I think we're going to make it work is if three towns share the costs and the development. Floor. So she said she'd take it back to, to whomever. You know, Stuyvesant has a mobile home park. It's all approved down there, and they did reach out to Mike for help on that. But, you know, we've approved a, a mobile home park exchange with another 70 double wide mobile homes. The developer is doing all the, you know, like setting the water and sewer himself, you know. Um, but yet, uh, he's had an application in the National Grid for over a year to try and get electric. There's five new homes sitting there. We can't get power to them to sell right. them, you know. So Mike did help a little bit with that. Well, I said, yeah, don't start cleaning it. Yeah. And then we we had another uh, issue uh, with a uh, company that does is look in Stuyvesant that's uh, looking to do uh, processed uh, agricultural products where they put protein. It's fortification. You're about the digester? No. no. No, this was. Uh, they were also looking for national grid help because uh, they needed three phase power. Yeah. No, this was the. Um, they had protein powder like yogurts and things. Well, you know how they fortify. There's a guy I know in Albany who fortifies drinks. They're going to fortify some type of uh, food chain for agriculture. And I'll give you their name. Where they and yeah, I know Pittman didn't brought three phase power yeah. in there to Dutch Hollow, and that took them two years. And time. then we had a call. Yeah, um, get that. The, uh, just some right, somebody right down. Coach Farm in Gallatin is for sale. They have three phase power. Um, here comes the solar company. What's that? No, <laughs> no. Is it? But is your no, it's not, is, it's is not, the it's challenge list location useful. specific, or would they be interested in that property? They're already bought this property. Okay. Uh, but the issue is, um, you know, it's a couple. It's a couple of hundred thousand dollars, and um, here it is. Um, her name, his name is John Thebault, and his uh, company is Gremba G R E M B R A Health, and uh, they uh, are processing some. Uh, Is Coach Farm like northwest of Pine Plains? Yeah, it's, is it in Pine Plains? No. Yeah, it's, it's in the lovely county of uh, Columbia, town of Gallatin. Mm -hmm. right. I think yeah, Ronnie Brook is Ronnie Brook is the Dutchess County in Anchorman. It's a New Zealand company that does freeze dried organ Pine Plains is organ powders sourced from pristine oh, pastures. Yeah, address farm, where are they? Organ powders. I think, uh, <laughs> organ powder. Where are they finding organs in the pasture? Must have killed something. <laughs> where are these organs? I have always walking through the winter fields. He's on uh, 1848 State Route 9J. Big red barn. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. yeah but we had a, but, right. but this goes more to a broader discussion of, of electric service because 
Uh, we had a woman that uh, supervisor, former supervisor Groton had called me about uh, in Germantown and she bought a kiln to, for her ceramic business, not, not realizing it needed three phase power and three, three phase power is like not on their plan to bring it down right. that street with it's a couple hundred thousand dollars a mile. You know. Can't believe 9J doesn't have three phase. 66 does. Um, shop this is, is this is north of Apis where it is. It's up towards like we're getting through over there. Yeah, so, you know, know north and north. Yeah. Um, the the red, reddest barn. Or, yeah, uh, the reddest barn in Columbia County. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and I only saw it from Zulu. Uh, or, 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 yeah. <laughs> I go by and I was yeah, wondering yeah. if it's I, a I big copied barn. it and toned it down. Yeah. But that's coming that, that, that trip, that thing it trip must not have been. But this is where Ray Ray, uh, Kukowski and I had had a conversation and I can send him some stuff that we're getting from the national, uh, I think it's League of Cities about small town infrastructure and, uh, you know, what is the plan and, you know, what are the national grid planners talking about? We did have a conversation with them. that, that Ray and well, Don Meltz participated in on their plans to uh, for EV. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, if there is going to be all of this infrastructure money beyond roads, bridges, and culverts, uh, what are we going to be doing to look for it? Right. Yeah, Don did a good job of putting that together, the, you know, mapping yeah. out where, where you could put high speed chargers in the future. So, uh, the three phase for the EV charger? For the high speed charger? Yeah. 480 volts, yeah. For a level two. Or level three. Level three. Yeah. We only have 4% of our town has three phase. So, um, any other questions on broadband or affordable housing before Jessica updates us on Columbia Forward and the micro enterprise grant program? We can give a quick update on Columbia Board. The uh, beginning of May was the National Small Business Week, which the Board of Supervisors um, uh, celebrated by proclaiming Columbia County Small Business Week um, in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we pushed out a marketing campaign, which is Shop Small, Shop Local, which was really um, successful. Uh, we also held a networking and informational um, event for small businesses. We had 80 businesses attend, um, which was huge. It was really well attended. Um, That was on the Wednesday during Small Business Week. Um, And we also had the um, SBA's upstate manager, uh, Jeff Boyce there, who is very excited and thrilled to learn about Columbia Forward and the programs that we all are doing um, throughout the county. Um, He's been here a couple of times meeting with a couple of our businesses. Um, that we've given loans to and grants. So uh, he's been really supportive of our efforts. How many of the businesses were new to you? Did you know, have, or were many of them established or were quite a few of them more recent businesses? It was a good mix. We had startups, some that actually, as a result, were looking to expand um, and, and looking for some funding. So it was really a good mix of startups and um, some banks participated and attended. Um, it was really well attended. Good. We had a good variety. Where did you have it? Um, it was at Iron and Grass, right inside of the city. Mm. And it was. I in, think that also well, attracted I mean, people. It's like uh, twenty-three. Yeah. That's where the uh, baseball and hot dog place used to be. And it was um, in partnership, as Columbia Forward is with the Chamber. And uh, you know, uh, Jerry Van Dusen uh, did a great. Van Buren did a great job uh, with, uh, and as Bill Garlick did as well. And uh, I was. Fortunate to be able to go down at Bill Garlick's uh, award ceremony with the Association of Columbia County or New York, whatever it is, and uh, you know, uh, we we also uh, Bill and I did some work uh, to promote an event that Mayor Johnson had in Hudson with the United Way, and uh, they had, uh, um, I guess United Way was much more active here ten years ago. Pretty good board, yeah. And uh, it's the same guy there. It's, uh, Peter Peter Gannon is the new director, uh-huh. and you know Peter's kind of a friend of mine. Uh, well, he is a friend of mine, but kind of a mentee of mine. And uh, so uh, they called and wanted to be reintroduced. And 
they wanted a small group um, and uh, really the, uh, we provided a handful of people, but it's primarily uh, the list out of the mayor's office. I'm so happy to hear they're um, reestablishing themselves. That's been a big call. Mm -hmm. One other thing is we have um, on June 15th, we are working and partnering with Green County as well as um, Center for Economic Growth, which is the region's economic development agency. We're going to be hosting an informational training se se session <clears throat> specific for manufacturers. So um, this is going to be at the Columbia Green Community College. We have about 200 manufacturers on our list right now that we're pushing sort of to, to try and attract. Um, uh, really excited about sort of being to announce, you know, talking to them about here's what we can do, here's the Columbia Board and, and CEDC, what we can do to provide any technical assistance to any type of producer or maker, uh, even agribusiness, anybody, any any business that produces something is really what we're trying to capture. Um, that same week, CEDC will be announcing our new manufacturers micro loan program. So this is sort of in conjunction with that, making funding available for working capital equipment, furniture, fixtures, whatever it may be um, for manufacturers. Um, and part of that, uh, as you know, we do have about a million, just under a million dollars uh, available between the county loan fund and the um, SBA micro loan fund to make loans. So we're doing a market. Um, did they agree on the amount today? Or we amount market two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a loan for small manufacturing businesses, up to fifty thousand dollars. And it's a little bit marketing pizzazz because you know every quarter we're going to have another industry, and you know we, we don't expect that we're going to have uh, enough demand that. Uh, that will blow, that we'll have to have multiple two hundred fifty thousand dollar buckets, but uh, I do think it'll raise people's awareness of what we're doing, because uh, I don't think we knew at the time of our annual meeting, and we haven't had a committee meeting since then. But the SBA awarded us another seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars of, of money for the next two years, and uh, we're signing the papers this week. We draw that down in two hundred and fifty thousand dollar tranches, but. That's going to put the loan fund uh, between what's on the street and what's available to lend up to $4 million. What's the percentage of lending? 5% we're doing there. No, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Six, of lent seven, 65, 65, 35. But, a bit, but, but there's new money coming in. I was going to say before, we're going to be below 50% if we take the new money. Well, the difficulty is that we have a requirement of it's a three year, yeah. we can use it over three years. But you want to draw, we won't pull it all down at once. Oh, I understand that. I'm, I'm more worried about using it than I am for it. Yeah. yeah. We want to, think, so the main thing is with the SBA money, when when we when people pay off the county loan fund money, it goes back into the county loan fund to be loaned again. Right. When people pay down the SBA money, we keep the interest and we pay them back the principal. So if we don't keep getting these tranches, and, and what we're looking at now is, um, with our current portfolio, um, with a million and a half out on a five-year or seven-year loan term, people are paying back two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, which is good because it's going to make that evergreen right. net of any losses. And but the money's coming back in. Is if you look at our how much did we lend that? How much did we have available in that portfolio last year versus this year? Sometimes we have more now because people paid us back faster than we could get it back on the street. That might be a COVID effect to a certain degree. Yeah. yeah. Is there any way to incentivize agricultural production? Like, yeah, they, is there anything there's a big need for it? We want to keep our agricultural community here and we want to keep people not having to go farther for different. Yeah. Processing. We're happy to talk about that so uh, and partner with uh, Hudson okay. Valley Agribusiness yeah. well on that okay. because they have all the funds as well. And we often split that, so we've uh, taken separate risks or splitting the risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but but also, uh, you know, the, the Board of Supervisors did approve and uh, just to touch base on, the, on where it is, but we were able to get a grant for $250,000 for Kleinfeld to build a uh, new. Um, 
farm worker housing, housing. Farm worker housing on this order. That, that met, and it was all driven by COVID standards. And something like that would qualify for the housing contract, right? Yeah. Is the 50,000 an SBA limit or uh, CDBC limit? Uh, the SBA limit is 50. We can go higher uh, than we have. 50,000 are manufacturers, kind of smaller micro manufacturers. Well, see, I think it is we'll, small, but I think we're looking at more like workers and capital inventory, sort of regenerate activity. Um, one of the things or yeah. we it have could done, be for equipment, but I don't know if that's in the past. We did a 10 year loan to Mario's to do uh, a whole new uh, building that yeah. that put you can a rack in building. Yeah, a rack. yeah. but I think that, um, you know, one of the things we've been looking at is with this much money and with the, the goal of the SBA program being startups and, and new businesses, uh, it should be taking some of the county money and, and uh, divesting it by, or diversifying it by doing, you know, maybe seven to 10 year loans up to a hundred. That's what I was just thinking. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at your ratio and thinking that we might need to get some bigger loans out yeah. there to suck up some of the capital. Our biggest issue was we've never gotten more than, uh, 500 400 from the sba so to get 775 and the best part with that is it come it will increase our grant for technical services and if you and use it turn it they'll give you more yeah right and i think too we have to be cautious about how not taking banks out right we're not we don't want to replace a bank if, if, if a manufacturer can go for traditional lending um usually yeah. typically yeah. that would be at a higher yeah. amount the interest rates where they are you're that could be the lender of choice. So yeah. Well, we're yeah. I think that's where then we compete with the bank. You know, there is a balance. And and that does you know, uh, yeah. That's that's a good point because um, we really encourage the banks to send us the people that are not bankable right now because of whatever. Well, let me ask you how many how many county locally owned banks do we have left that haven't been bought out by larger regional or national banks? One, right? Just green. Just green. 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 Well, no, right. <laughs> they're the ones that would call us first, to, uh, right? Because yeah. because they're watching, right? The, right. the, the say, people in Syracuse don't care. We didn't want to take out the two and three branch banks or the one branch bank here. Or they don't exist. Yeah. I think the the real issue is that the people who would come to us would be people who would have been banking with the larger banks that don't get the service because they see us as service conscious and that would be green's customer if uh you know if, so we we'll work through that but we have been sensitive to that because uh frankly it's been pointed out to us at times i know uh is salisbury bank um active in the southern part of the county not particularly because that's another yeah. small bank yeah. we're, we're seeing uh rhinebeck ulster savings which i'm on on the board of they don't do much here because of that uh, but Rhinebeck has been uh, looking at deals here. Pioneer and Albany has been looking at deals here because they realize, you know, community bank out of Syracuse is just too big. Key Bank, if you are getting anything under five hundred thousand dollars, you're doing it with artificial intelligence with a phone, phone and phone line and a computer in Maine. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not as worried about being the yeah the lending entity of choice in Columbia County or Columbia County business. But you're. I think so. Another um, place we do have a large pipeline of applicants that we're working with, which makes us sort of the next item on the agenda is the CDBG microenterprise program. Um, really, what we're looking and asking for is based on that pipeline, based on the success of the Columbia Forward grants, we're requesting that the county apply for a CDBG microenterprise grant of $300,000. Um, it's similar to Mike mentioned the Climbs Kills. It's the same. It's the community event with block grants, but this is specific to micro enterprises. This would be grants to um, businesses of five or fewer employees. Um, and so, where you could really what we put here is where CEDC would administer the grant um, and look at the pool of 300000 and how you, that would get dispersed. Um, I think we have based on our existing pipeline a good amount of um, businesses that could take advantage of that now um so i think in your package you'll see um uh, uh just a, a proposal for this grant as well as a resolution and uh the public <laughs>
Do you have any sense of how many um, are most of the micro businesses located in their in the in the communities where people reside? Are they home based businesses? There's a huge mix um, out of the 2000, so 1900 businesses in Columbia County. Um, more than 90% of them are uh, less than 25 employees. Break it down further into that uh, category that's micro enterprise, it's still a huge percentage um, in the county. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, but because of the way this uh, particular program that we're proposing works, it's just another tool in the toolkit. Uh, but it is really designed, uh, you have to have under 10 employees. Right? Under, you have to have five or fewer. Five or fewer. One includes the owner. And, 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 and we see it, uh, we had actually, the Chamber and CEDC had proposed $100,000 uh, grant during, in DRI to set this program up and apply for these funds. Uh, but um, to serve, uh, minority women and veteran-owned businesses and in, in, in Hudson uh, you know we think that uh, you know this is a this will enable us to create a pipeline for the SBA funding because uh, you know if, if they are starting out like this uh, again with a focus on women minority and, and veteran once they grow to a point where they have credit enough to get a 25 or fifty thousand dollar loan is what is the maximum uh, $35,000. Yeah. The best thing about this program is it's a requirement is that we would develop a uh, training program for entrepreneurs and they wouldn't be eligible for the grant until they completed the training program, um, which would cover sort of basic business skills. Um, I didn't see a limitation. Is this a limitation to veteran women? No, 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 it would be open to all. So the one that we were going to do in the city was, but that's, I like this because it's most of our towns, if you look at minor and major home occupations. Minor home occupations are usually three people and under major home occupations right. five before you get to a commercial zoning. So it's the field to most of our um, well, from home and it allows workers, me. excavators. Landscapes. And the other thing I think absolutely to buy a, a additional equipment or inventory. And it also um, allows them to stay in the community and work as firemen or other yeah. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Which one of the few programs that would match outside of Hudson the area. And, and the other aspect of this is if we go back and look at the we have a list of the who, who received PPP one and two, uh, you know, there were 500 businesses that showed one employee. Uh, as, and so we've got a, a marketing list right there. So we need your approval. I'll move this resolution. A second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Kelly will schedule a public hearing. Great idea. Thank you so much. Is all this wording have to go into the have to go into the public oh, hearing? Public because that's about a two hundred dollar we'll public hearing ad. We'll we'll pay. 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 If you come out of the administration of the program, yeah. it's awarded. I will say that um Office of Community Renewal is the one that um administers it for the state yeah. in conversation with them Friday. They're very excited, they're aware of all the stuff that's going on in Columbia County and the programs we have. They actually are been encouraging the county to do this. Um, and I think CEDC is in a good position now to be able We've to looked at it before, right? but it was just with COVID, we had to come out of COVID before we could figure out uh, how to do this. And not that I'm competitive, but uh, Green County was just awarded money for uh, similar loan programs. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question. Any, yeah. any information on Flanders and what's yes. going on? Um, you know, we um, did speak with the controller. Uh, the controller has uh, put me in, in touch with a vice president who I reached out to, who was away for two weeks and is back uh, tomorrow. Uh, they will close uh, based on their notice to the Department of Labor on July 3rd. I know that uh, we've that been- a war in labor? A war in those? Was yeah. Mass layoff? Yeah, mass layoff. They had the 90 days, I think it is. Yeah. Um, we have sent, uh, you know, we've talked, they're talking with Chris Nardone at the, the New York Works office. Uh, the people who are, build, are building out the old town and country market uh, with SEC 7, uh, they're going to do mass production of meals, uh, high-end meals that they sell in New York City and elsewhere. They, they freeze them and 
I think I told you I asked them for the list, so I know where not to go. But uh, <laughs> uh, they do some low-end well, they want wheels on wheels. That's, they do. They're very interested, and I was going to mention that too. But they went. It's a we don't want to go. They went right. over. They went over to uh, meet with the HR director at Flanders to see if they could hire some people because they're, you know. Um, but going, I did mention to them after the last board meeting uh, that uh, you know would would doing a. Uh, affordable price meal. Uh, their only issue was delivery. We got the delivery. We have the, I said I thought they had no. the delivery. So they'd yeah. like to meet with whoever at the uh, administrative level or whoever at the committee level they should be meeting. Do we have any employees affected by Flanders closing? 65, I think. Yeah. It was right around that. Why, why are they just out they're, here? They're, they're, they, why are they closing? Flanders are in great demand. Uh, their whole business model has crashed, and okay. uh, you know I don't know if it's because of foreign competition, but I'll get more information on that. We've had two people call me as to who they contact, who should they contact to buy the building. Uh, Maybe the county should buy it. County likes to buy it. Those, yeah. You know, one at a time, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's uh, anything else. I think the city needs that one. You know? You know, that's, it's right over the line, which is yeah, great because right. it's a county IDA project and we need some money. But it was kind of a weird move because they moved from North Carolina with operating costs yeah. so much less than mm, right. there. I never understood that. Yeah. No. Well, it, was it a, was it connected? Money. That's what got them here. And was it connected to CAS? Because weren't they making similar? Yeah, it was a CAS. It was, it was, it was it a CAS spinoff kind of. Or, yeah. So they only have one product, but the price of filters no, no, has no, gone out ten times. I did a lot of things. What kind of schools have specialized filter? They just have a regular air filters. And again, the price has gone up ten times in since COVID happened. You know, with typical air filters. I don't know what happened. I know we're a little bit over, but if we, unless there's any other questions, I can go briefly into the solar discussion. Yes. Um. You know. I think we've seen where uh, there was a solar company that got in very early and kind of set the standard of three thousand dollars a megawatt uh, for uh, the under five megawatt pilot. Uh, there was another group that came in and uh, they didn't know about uh, that and they offered thirty five hundred. Um, and in each of those cases, those pilots were done uh, independently by the town, the school district, and the county. The county never did one until after this school district and town uh, signed up so that we weren't you know, putting them at, in a position of uh, being forced, feeling forced to sign. We had a, uh, and we split the, 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 the way those pilots were written, the fee was to the annual pilot payment was split 50% to the school district, 25 to the town and 25 to the county. So a company came in and decided that uh, after I told them that, that they were going to offer 3,500, but they were going to, they put in the proposal and that they sent to the Ichabod Crane School District, that they were gonna split it based on the pro rata percentage of taxes. So now the school district's gonna get 70%, the, the county's gonna get uh, 15 or 20%, and the county's, and the town's gonna get 4%. And the most impact of the solar project of any of those is the town. Well, yeah. That's gonna be. Well, so I told them it doesn't work, and that the way I would adjust it was to ensure that the county and the town got 20, whatever 25% would have been had he done it right in the first place, he had to gross up his payment. And it meant the school district would get a little more money, but it brought the payment up to $5,000 a megawatt. So in other words- Why did they always base it? They're basing it on the ratio of taxes as opposed to impact. Well, because pilots are generally done uh, based on the ratio. On the ratio. Right. Yeah. But that, I mean, that solar, doesn't work here. Solar should be, done. we had, I had this discussion for hours, solar should be always based on the town being the major. Right. Impact. It should be 50 to the town and the other two. Yeah. yeah. But the school was happy to get the money, right? Yeah. yeah. So well, that's why no. the solar provider care what the division of the pot is. Because he did, his, his company always did it that way and he didn't. Uh, why would he, would he oppose a different model? Yes, well, he already offered it to the school district. They accepted it and yeah, said, uh, yes, they did. And, and, they, and they said, uh, the lawyer for the school district and the business manager I spoke to, and they said, well, how are we going to tell our constituents that we uh, were offered 70% and we agreed to take 50? 
Because we have the same constituents. The town and school district have the same constituents. It's, and it's right. a question of where the yeah. Yeah. money is. Yeah, it's, it's got to be a better way of going about it. Yes. Right. So here's where we're going. Yeah, the pilot's always going to the school first. And then the so are getting making no you sense of it. You may have remembered that uh, I mentioned that Green County adopted a local law that uh, now mm -hmm. dictates to the school district and the town what, or what's going to happen. And they adopted uh, $8,750 a megawatt. And that's $8,000 a megawatt plus a uh, $750 a megawatt um, community benefit charge. All right, so is that a, a, a standard pilot? Yeah. Like, yeah. But how is, what's their split? Um, they split it 50-30, um, 50-25-25, because that's how nice Serta put it in the model. The school? Yeah. Well, well, but let's, let's get, let's get, so I asked them, well, how did you come up with $8,000 a megawatt? And uh, Ray Ward, the director of real property tax services at Green County, tells me the short answer is we were able to negotiate all uh, pilots prior to the adoption of the local uh, law at a rate of 8,000. So when we put it in place, we use that as, as the model. Um, he said that um, it also uh, equated to $750 a megawatt. Uh, for a community host charge. So if you're at, at five megawatts, you can get $22,000 up front. Um, he said this That's was a one-time payment. Or? Yeah, one-time upfront payment. <laughs> so you, you pay that when you sign the pilot. So your first year, you're, pay, you're paying for an extra year, right? It's without any generation. Uh, he says that um, this was done in order not to waste countless hours negotiating in the future. Uh, the local law offers consistency for all the projects and does not allow for negotiations. It's, now, I will go back and, and valid, ver, ver, verify what the split is and see if I can find other communities that split it where the town gets 50%. I, I just don't, yeah, I don't understand. The school has no impact whatsoever. It's not a child impact. There's not a school cost impact. The town, town and fire. The well, town again, and, and the uh, add-on taxes are not exempt, remember. Uh, you can't get a pilot on a uh, special district so the but schools roads. are just looking for money where they can find it so if right. somebody offers them money, but the governor just gave them tons of extra money she says and he thinks now what ray, what ray says is um <laughs> you must say that with the adoption of uh real property tax law 5575b uh the discounted which requires that the discounted cash flow model be used for valuing uh plants that don't get a pilot um he believes that that will result in valuing these facilities at 25 to 30 percent of their true value and in the future will be more advantageous for these facilities just to pay the full tax not to go for an exemption or a pilot so their assessment will be lower lower yeah so the state is promoting this statewide so that communities such as uh you know the assessor can't come in and say, well, you're building a $25 million project and I put a $25 million assessment on it. So, now is, so isn't that a win-win? I mean, wouldn't we rather pay the, pay the full assessed value? Yeah, but not because they pay less than taxes. They won't come for a pilot because the $8, at an $8,000 a megawatt, the pilot's going to cost more than them. The right. Because now, they're not allowed to now, assess it. I, I disagree to one, one respect. I always found our lender, when I was doing these types of projects uh, for, for my company, the lender always wanted to know what it was. Fixed. They don't want to find out that you, know, you get in a fight with your assessor and right. it goes up next year or down right. next year. Or, and they got to have a search for tax for appeal. But um, so I think we should raise it. Uh, I'm thinking that it, it should. Uh, and, and then I think what we would do is, is we would before this, before we ask the county to take any action, we talk to the school districts and to the town and and then re readjust the. We have to talk to school districts. Uh, they're local law. They, they pass they pass the budgets and laws all the time. Not, not us. Well, I think you know the good news is if you adjust the percentage of allocation and you've raised the amount, they'll get about the same as they, they would get. You made a comment that they're going to the school district first. Well, no. What happens is it's just in the pattern. They send out the the things all at the same time. So the town gets it, the county gets it, and the school district. The school gets district it. signs it the, that night. And then no, <laughs> no, no. But what happened was he put in there the split where the. Uh, the agreement that we all got 
he said that it would be split based on a percentage of existing tax yeah. ratio. Yeah. And I had told him that's not how we do it here. Yeah. So I called him up. I said, "Yes, you just, you just <laughs> no. yeah, in my town, it's eleven dollar, like thirteen dollar school, six dollar county, one dollar town." Yeah, right. That's about what we are. Yeah. So it's mostly your. Well, the town. Your town's looking at ninety-five percent of the impact and, and ten percent. Town is going to get four hundred dollars out of a fifteen thousand dollar a year payment. Yeah. And I said that's not going to work. Now I don't really have a dog in this fight because we don't have any face power. But I said it's just stupid for all towns. Well, but you could put no. five megawatts on a distribution line. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so I, I, I haven't seen our line. I don't think there. this is very helpful Local feedback, power. and it takes it another step because uh, it's not just what the base charge will be; it's what the uh distribution will be so is there anything is there anything out there that would suggest that we need to look at this sooner rather than later are there any large projects in the pipeline well the only large project the board of supervisors uh voted uh would, would not go through this because these projects are only you only do these pilots for five megawatt opt-outs anything over five megawatts if they need a, if they want a pilot they have to go to the idea and in the case of the large project in columbia county the board of supervisors unanimously passed a resolution directing the IDA not to provide any benefits okay. without the town's consent. And I don't see the town consenting in the remainder of the century. I mean, I think so either. <laughs> and rightfully so, probably. But even in that case, if, if you're part of the pilot, I hope they've got a majority of the income, then you can make a property value, you can buy land, you can do a lot of things to ameliorate. <laughs> yeah. Instead of, instead of working. And my thought would be, you give the school district 25% and you tell the developer they have to do uh, an internship and do a, go in and do a, a, a segment on uh, solar power generation <laughs> in the classroom. This, this yeah, that was my other, you know, like, so when Green County did this local law, they're, they're then mixing all of the towns from being able to negotiate your separate community benefit. So well, they, I think they're going to split the community benefit. The community, let me find more out about how they split it because i mean here we should all go to the town you could enter into a pilot agreement but the town could negotiate their own right. uh, so right. well that's, that's what, what we did with uh east light powered um right. i think one of the one of the three wouldn't go with the three thousand they wanted more and the other two had already so, signed up so what do you know i was before my time and i really hadn't looked into yeah. you know, writing some nasty letters lately but what do you know about ELP and GAP? Well, Are you a part of that project? No, that occurred before I got here. And then what, what happened was they went to the supervisor. You get 100% of, of the pilot. They went to the, well, if you were going to do a project, you sent notices to the school district, the town, and the county 60 days before you were going to proceed. So each of those jurisdictions had to say whether they wanted a pilot or not. Nobody in those days it was not clear oh, who was, who had to where it was, was to be sent. Line. It was a timeline. And the timeline right. expired yeah. and the town was the only one that responded, so they got a hundred percent of it. And at the same time, with you know in agreement and with full respect of the supervisor at the time, he told me, Well, where do they, we get all the impact? Why wouldn't we get all the money? Unless it's on a county road, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but what worries me is if if this new law that uh, I have to look at the new section of the real property tax law, yeah, that's, that, and I know that uh, in uh, Craig Surprise told me he went to one of the uh, assessor organizations day long sessions on this. But if you're going to assess all of these as discounted cash flow uh, projections, doesn't matter what the cost of the facility is or what the uh, right. capital investment is. And then you know, how do you, how can you predict energy rates? I mean, a year, two years ago, three and four cents was the energy rate. Uh, during the height of COVID, they were paying 12 and 14 cents at certain hours of the day. Try 19. Yeah, 19. Well, wholesale. Oh, wholesale. Yeah, because most, uh, well, more than a, the hydroelectric plant. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, wholesale. More than a third of, of the bill that anyone pays residential or commercial is delivery. Okay. So. And that's where these people get in trouble when they go to these aggregators because mm -hmm. the aggregator says well i'm going to charge you this and it's oh almost equal or less but it's guaranteed to what you're paying but they don't tell you there's five cents of delivery or whatever. <laughs> um emc meets at 6 30. Okay. Okay. i'm sorry we, we, we're supposed to keep we these to an hour anyway. no that was thank you 
Yeah. Yeah, let's ramp that up somehow. I don't know yeah, how we get there. But we, got to ramp well, we, want to, we want to do two things. We want to ramp it up and get a greater percentage to the town. Right. Okay. We do have one more resolution. The Columbia Green Workforce Development Board is requesting to appoint Ms. Peggy Moon. Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Well, you interviewed Jessica. I mean, you're just letting this lady do it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No I remember you, the first time I met you, you came to a CEPC board meeting. Yes, and, 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 and I made the mistake of saying yeah, there's a second to one of the reasons I wanted not to make it appear that we were competing with banks is we wanted them to join at the highest uh, uh, membership level. And you had to pay to play. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Take care.